And this, this prayer comes to us from uh, the Reverend Gina Jenkins, the chaplain at St. Paul's Episcopal School. And it's a quote from L.R. Nost that we thought would be nice for tonight. So let us pray. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things break and all things can be mended, not with time as they say, but with intention. So go, love intentionally, extravagantly and unconditionally. The broken world waits for the Christ light in you. Amen. Amen. Um, so just to get us started tonight, um, I know after we all, all we went through last year with Hurricane Ida, it's kind of hard to believe we've got another hurricane season already approaching and watching the tropics already. And I know that for many of us, um, especially those of us who went through Hurricane Katrina or those who suffered extensive damages like several of our parishes did last year, this time of year can always spark a bit of PTSD. So please know that we are all in this together and that this can also be a group where we can provide pastoral support for each other. Um, we wanna be very proactive in our approach to disaster preparation. And the very best thing that we can do is plan and prepare and support one another. So to help us do that, um, tonight we welcome the Reverend Robert Beasley, Rector of St. Michael's Episcopal Church in Mandeville. And Father Beasley has also um, been the Diocesan Disaster Preparedness and Response Coordinator since 2020. And he has a long track record of work in this area. And um, he's worked with ERD, actually, uh, the Episcopal Relief and Development um, in Galveston, Texas, back in 2010, um, responding to Hurricane Ike. And uh, I believe the team he worked with there had also been on the ground here in town during Katrina. So um, working with some of the best. <laughs> but um, Robert, we appreciate your leadership. And thanks so much for um, guiding us through our discussion tonight. Absolutely. Thank you, Ken Reed. And so there are a plethora of resources for congregations to develop intense emergency plans, um, some of which are on our diocesan websites. The time tonight, majority of our time tonight, will um, instead of looking at kind of step-by-step -step protocols, is going to be brainstorming how can your congregation best respond to the needs of your community in times of need, and are there any things you can do in the next week, month, year that can better prepare your congregation to respond in those times of need. Um, I've been a priest for five years. Ken Reed's been a priest for about 11 months now. If we only celebrated the Eucharist whenever there was a disaster, we would be terrible at it. And so similarly, um, this first about hour of our time together is gonna be spent brainstorming what are some of the ways that your congregation can already um, develop ministries so that when the time comes, you can have the people in place to respond to them? And so we're going to go through, we're going to break, go into breakout rooms. Um, and just in a few minutes, um, a little um, question will pop up and it'll ask you, which room do you want to go into? So what we're gonna do in, in this first breakout room is we're gonna think about what are the assets of your church? And we've got about um, minus myself and Allison, we have 13 people. Um, some of you are from the same congregation, most of you are not. And so what we're gonna do is um, in the, I'm putting it in the chat right now. If your church averages zero to 50 on a Sunday, I want you to choose breakout room number one. If you're in the 51 to 100 range, which is probably most of you, um, room number two, the 101 to 150, room number three, and 150 plus, go to room number four. This way, 
Um, my guess is that similar sized congregations will have similar resources and this will um, be able to kind of create good conversations. I'm gonna pop into the rooms as soon, like once they get situated and if it looks like only one or two people are in a room, I'll ask you to kind of reassign yourself. But I want you to, this first breakout time, I want you to spend 10 minutes. You're gonna talk about what are the assets of your church? Do you have a parking lot? Do you have a big parish life center? After Hurricane Zeta came through, it was kind of semi-ideal time to be hit with a hurricane. It was late October, um, but what happened, a lot of folks lost electricity and they lost food. And so there's emergency food response. Um, food, stable food boxes were put together. Um, I led a group at St. Michael's. We put together a hundred boxes. We wanted to give them to our neighbors in need. Um, we put out flyers to different areas. We tried to spread the word a few days ahead of time. And in the three hours that we were handing out boxes, we only handed out three boxes because it was something that we had never done before. The community wasn't used to us being a resource for food. And so we kind of learned from that. But I want you all in this first breakout group to just think about every single resource you have, whether that's you have a ton of lawyers that could help with paperwork, whether that's you have space, a parking lot for the National Guard, if you have a commercial kitchen, if you have a washer and dryer, everything could be an asset um, or a resource. And so let me open up the breakout rooms. And before we do that, does anyone have any questions um, for this first breakout session? I'm not sure how to get into a breakout room. I've, I've not gone through that before. Yeah, well, you should, Mary, you should have in front of you, um, our, is, is there a type of invitation to breakout rooms right now? I just opened them. Right, join a breakout room. So Mary, what um, church do you attend? Trinity, Trinity Morgan City. I so, should be in number one. Okay, yeah, so go to, do you see room number one? No, should I be on? Oh, yeah, I see breakout rooms and well, I see Mary Catherine, so I guess I'm in breakout well, room one. Two. Oh, okay. Back again. So I hope that um, first discussion was fruitful. Um, we're going to spend about three or four minutes just um, opening up to the floor of um, what did you come up with? Was there, did other folks think of things that you realize that, oh, my church does that too? Um, so what'd you, what'd you get out of that first question? Ooh. Okay, you want me to go? Great. Yeah. So. Okay. I ended up in group one just because I, I was dumb and hit the wrong button, but it, it was it was okay. Uh, I met a lot of nice people and it was great. Um, but, but being that they were the smaller churches, we talked about how at St. Michael's, like we have the Parish Life Center, we have showers, um, we have bathrooms, we have a commercial kitchen. A lot of these smaller churches don't have that, but all of them have um, parish halls, they have classrooms, and you could have linemen in your area, National Guard or people like that, even if you can't, you know, let them bathe, they could certainly use your bathrooms, bring their own blow up mattresses and have a place to spend the night. And depending on how much land is involved in your, with your parish, um, you could let the National Guard, if they are there, 
you know, set things up like the food distributions and that sort of thing. So you can almost provide a physical facility building, even if you don't have warm bodies to do things like cook meals and that sort of thing. Exactly. Anyone else? Yeah, along the same lines, St. Luke's and Baton Rouge has a lot of space. I know after Katrina, it's before my time at St. Luke's, but after Katrina, uh, the woman's hospital was next door. It's now the police department. But we had overflow uh, from the woman's hospital. We had people living in uh, our fellowship hall. And we also have a gymnasium size space, Witter Hall, with a kitchen. Um, and so, you know, in, in a real emergency, we could house people. We don't have showers, but we have space on our campus to, if, if temporary showers could be set up, uh, that could easily be done. And, you know, if you needed like National Guard to have a place to camp out, we've got green on the middle school side of the campus, uh, including on a baseball field. <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, so th there's a, there are a lot of options there in terms of just a space to accommodate people and, and for, you know, food could be distributed from our site. Uh, so, you know, that we, we've got resources on, on hand um, to, uh, to be able to help if, uh, if that was necessary from, uh, from our campus. Yeah. One of the things that um, Karsten mentioned, Brian, was that being so close to proximity of the police station, you have your electricity back. Well, that's that would not, be a benefit. not entirely accurate. The last storm that we had, I live real close to the campus. In fact, a good field goal kicker could lob one uh, across uh, above some housetops into the front lawn <laughs> of the campus. Um, and we lost power and the campus lost power and we didn't, the, the St. Luke's campus got power back around the same time that we did. But I think there was a time when the, when the woman's hospital was next door that the campus was on the same power grid, but I think that may have changed, mm -hmm. unfortunately. One good aspect of uh, letting the linemen know you will open up your facility, my guess is they'd get you power back pretty quick. I would hope so. <laughs> exactly. Something to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. So, especially because of Hurricane Ida being so fresh in our minds, um, the next 10 minutes we're going to break out into the same groups. And I just want you all to brainstorm. What are the needs of your community in a time of disaster, whether that's a wind event or a water event? Um, and keep in mind that a disaster lasts more than a week or two. Um, I know there are, um, I live in New Orleans and I see countless blue roofs on folks' homes. And so um, whether that's even help with FEMA paperwork is something that folks need. So. We're gonna break out for um, another 10 minutes and I want you to just brainstorm anything and everything folks could need in a time of disaster. All right, so the needs of your community in times of disaster um, should be a pretty easy one, but just popcorn responses. Well, oh, I forgot to add to ours first aid kits. So I'll throw that out there. <laughs> nope. One thing that was very critical for us, I think, was getting out into the neighborhood and walking around and assessing what, what the community is going, what's going, what's going through, getting idea, uh, getting information from them, as well as finding um, very uh, reliable information of where, what resources already are available. Um, two critical things for us because every storm every event has different needs um, uh, and so how to get a quick assessment but also you know being in the midst of the community so uh, uh, and saying we're going to be back um, uh, and being able to say oh well you know you can go here um, sometimes just getting that reliable information is huge yeah 
And just to piggyback on that, we talked about a calling tree with the vestry, divvying up families uh, within your congregation and just checking in with the needs um, because um, some churches have uh, parishioners that are spread around in a, a large geographic area. And so their needs may differ. Uh, and then so getting specific needs for individuals and identifying what needs to be done, whether there's a tree in the front yard or getting out their house or whether they need refrigeration for medicine um, so that we can uh, react appropriately. But I really like the idea of walking around your immediate neighborhoods as well. Did anybody, did any ideas come up that you wouldn't otherwise have thought of? One idea that came out of our session um, along those lines as well communication is, is setting up a communications hub on your website that's evergreen that's something that's always there just a place where parishioners and others can go to find that information that they need in that moment because you know we may have issues with phones and apps and things of that nature but websites are surprisingly reliable and sorry if you hear my daughter in the background there. <laughs> um, but you know they're a way that it gets information out and you know, it can be easily updated these days. Um, most websites are pretty easy to use and just, it would be a, an easy way for parishioners to remember where to go. You can set a URL that, that basically doesn't change and they know they can go there and get the information that they need. Yeah, landing, landing site for information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just kind of thought of something uh, taking back off of what we discussed in, in room two in regard to the calling tree, another good option is to use an app like GroupMe. Sometimes calls won't go through, but text messages will. Yes. So if you use GroupMe, then you can go ahead and utilize, like the Vestry could then have a GroupMe and they can easily text each other to the entire group. Yeah. So that's an idea. Yeah, Tim, I, I agree. I think that there was a, there, there was a lot of concern, especially after Ida, about um, <laughs> cell phone um, um, outage was, was horrible. Um, and so, um, and as, you know, which you would expect, but it, it, it really, um, that's good to have, because we were trying to say, what are some alternatives to, um, to the thing? Cell phone. Yeah, you know, cell phone. And um, piggybacking off of what Tim said, Mother Allison, you're in, in the diocesan office, right? During Hugo, I was teaching in an archdiocese school, um, the Archdiocese of New Orleans. And what they did is knowing that the individual churches couldn't necessarily always get, uh, of course, apps weren't invented then, but, you know, things like that. The archdiocese set up once they got going the website where anybody who worked for the archdiocese, you went in there, said who you were, where you work, and then they um, let the individual churches or school knows. So they, they acted as the main umbrella and then disseminated to the churches. So I don't know if, if you know, the, you know, Edola maybe has something where people could get into there and then that's disseminated like to the rectors of each church. I've heard from these people from your church. I, it may be simpler now that they have things like Tim's talking about, and that might be an easier way of doing it. Yeah, we the diocese does have um, access to a emergency response communication tool called Alert Media through the Episcopal Church, um, but that's directly for clergy um, communications. Um, and we'll talk more with kind of Karen and the other kind of diocesan team to see how it can best be utilized on the congregation level. Okay. Um, here's something that I, I thought about and I don't know how relevant it is to a lot of the congregations but if you have someone in your uh, congregation that is a drone pilot or has a drone um, that would be really good to uh, do a quick assessment of your buildings and your property um, and in your neighboring uh, area as well um, that way you can give a good report and figure out what your status is and then compare um, your week to week and how you you've managed to uh, to to solve some of those issues. Um, Alfonso, I'm just going to pick on you because you're from my church. Drone pilot was that a resource that you thought of uh, that your church has? Yes, my I did not think about that, but um, 
Well, I, I want to want to tie tie our first. I'm I'm gonna um, segue into our third breakout room. So now I want you to think about um, the resources that your congregation has, and it could be resources that you didn't think of when you had your breakout. The needs of a community in a time of disaster, whether that's food, shelter, laundry service, um, finding out if a roof is damaged, um, having access to any type of communication. Um, like what are the, the variety of needs in your immediate community? And what are the ways, um, how can your church's resources be leveraged to meet the needs of your community in a time of a disaster? Um, any questions about that before we break out? Yeah, Stephen, you're. Um, you, you said community. Do you, does that mean both uh, your parish as well as the community itself? Yeah, the your 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 congregation members as well as the one mile radius around your physical location. Okay, great. Thanks. Yep. So your, your discussion, what are your church resources that could be helpful in times of disasters? So what did, um, what did y'all discuss? Um, this is Susan. I think the biggest thing I thought of and got out of and getting out of this is organization. Um, when we know that the storms are coming, when hurricane season gets here, um, in preparing water, food, um, a calling tree, um, you know, the vestry calling parishioners. We do have, you know, we do have communi great communication with our website, but if all that's down, then we need to go to other resources. But it's making me think more of organization with, you know, helping not only our parishioners, but the people around our church, which is, again, is in a great location. It's in a really good location to help people that might, you know, might not have any resources. Susan, remind me what congregation you're a part of. St. Margaret's in Baton Rouge. We're, we're on Perkins and Segan. Yeah. Um, one thing that I've learned, I've been in the New Orleans area for about five years now, is the different volunteer organizations that are sponsored through Orleans Parish and the city of New Orleans. Um, so I'm sure between Together Baton Rouge and other mm -hmm. organizations, um, just to be on folks, just to be on um, newsletters. And so so as, as Stephen indicated earlier, kind of knowing what other people are already doing and right. connecting them and just learning ahead of time. That was a lesson that we learned at St. Michael's was if we ever try to do a food drive, we need, we need to build better relationships with organizations that already do that. Mm -hmm. um, and we do. We but, have some relationships like that. We do. Great. Um, great. One thing during Ida which at St. Anna's, we got together with the councilman and councilwoman of Orleans Parish, and they were having uh, distribution for food. So um, they would call Father Terry up and say, you know, how many things of food, whatever they were given, you want, and we'd say for 50 people. And then we would open up the parish and well, actually we started delivering it to the, to the parish people, our, our parishioners that needed it. So uh, that, that was a great thing that uh, the uh, council men and council women all these parish did. Yeah, we learned in that same situation when we tried to give out food and only three of the 100 were taken that first day, we connected with local um, school counselors in elementary schools and learned the families who are receptive to when churches and nonprofits um, have, have items to give away. And so we started driving food out um, throughout St. Tammany Parish. Um, and so I, I know some conversation at St. Michael's, if we're kind of the next step, kind of the, the the gap in need 
is getting food to the homes of people in need. And um, any other any other thoughts that you wouldn't have otherwise come up with um, in terms of resources that your congregation has in times of need? I mean, outside, this is Tim in St. Augustine's in Metairie. Uh, outside of the physical plant that we could house, one of the things that we discussed was actually using the uh, parishioners who evacuate as a resource themselves, because they're going to go to places that have, you know, internet and electricity, and they can find out information sometimes better and more accurately than we can. So, you know, don't, don't forget the people who evacuate can still be a resource. Right. Yeah. Carson, can we put you on the spot to talk about what you... Yeah, we, we talked about something kind of that ties into what you said, but instead of the our own evacuees, it was having a sister church that's maybe regional but far enough that they're not going to be hit by the same storm. So maybe for a Louisiana church, it would be somebody in the Midwest. And if we get hit by a hurricane, we're immediately tied into that sister church where they ask us what we need. If they were to get hit by a tornado, we're immediately in contact with them to see if we can identify a need. Um, just somebody already there so you're not having to scramble to find that find that resource after an event has already happened it's kind of fun to that, that you mentioned that because i'm going to be doing a uh, disaster it and one of the things i thought about was a strategic relationship with the church in a safe area yeah mm -hmm. so that's that's perfect yeah. yeah um so i just want we're going to take a five minute break in just a second but i want you your takeaway i hope that your takeaway from this first hour is um, just new ideas for ministries that your congregation could implement before the storm happens. If you think that your congregation would be great at providing space for folks, see if you have a family promise organization in your area. If you think your congregation would be great at taking drone pictures, see about starting a drone club um, at your congregation and um, I mean, get those things on, on the ground or in the air before the disaster hits. So when the disaster does hit, you have that system in place. Um, have relationships with your local law enforcement or sheriff's office or parish emergency management um, director. Um, and so don't wait until the storm happens to respond. Um, so that's that, that's the sound bite for the last hour. Um, I'm going to stop our pause our recording for a second. And now I'm going to hand it over to Chad Brown. Chad Brown has been in the construction. Um, I, I realized during the break that I should have reached out to Chad and Tim about doing proper introductions. So I'm going to turn it over to Chad and let him introduce himself. But I know firsthand that he has years of experience in um, South Louisiana and is gonna to talk to us about physical building preparedness. Okay. Um, all right, everybody hear me, we're good? All right, so uh, my name is Chad Brown. I have uh, been in the building industry, building houses and light commercial buildings for 24 years in the greater New Orleans area. Um, I served in the Marine Corps for four years prior to that. So uh, being around disaster and, and rebuilding from disaster um, has been a part of the fabric of who I am. I survived Katrina and was here during Katrina and did a lot of rebuilding of, of houses post Katrina as well. Um, this storm, uh, we stayed away from housing. We did no house. We, we did two houses after Ida, but we also did two churches, uh, one being St. Paul's and one being St. Matthew's in Homa Episcopal. Um, so we, uh, you know, always learning, right? We're always learning. And so I learned a lot from the storm, uh, on, on a lot of little detail things that are the things that, uh, I've served on the vestry at St. Paul's and the things when I was on the vestry that we just didn't think about, even as a builder and contractor prior to uh, prior to Ida, these things just didn't touch my radar. So I'd like to share those uh, for about five minutes. You guys can make notes and then um, maybe do a, a Q and A at the end of that. Any specific questions you have, I'd be happy to answer. Um, 
So we're looking at it now at St. Paul's for before the storm items, things to, and I'm only going to speak in the frame of, of reconstruction and, and buildings right now. I'm, you know, outside of the community, specifically keeping my discussion to the building, the buildings and, and the physical facility. So before the storm, um, there are some things that we all know we need to do to our house, right? You need to video the inside of your house. You need to video the exterior. Um, that gets done maybe once every four years in my house. Um, and so I know that it's something that needs to be done every year, especially on the physical plant and facility of, of your church and school, if there is one tied to your church, uh, both inside and out and on the roof, if you can do it. Um, one of the things that, that we see is going to need to be enacted, and there's a couple of reasons to it, and, and one is to, to have a professional contractor Go, go over your facility inside and out prior to hurricane season annually. Um, you can pay for this or you can find someone in the con congregation like St. Paul's has with me um, that, you know, I'll, I'll do it free every year for them. But what it does is it builds a relationship with a local contractor or builder so that when there is an incident and there is uh, damage that you at least have a first layer to turn to. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's one thing that I would encourage. And, and what it brings to your attention is the, the things that most physical plants, churches, schools, and, and institutions do not like to spend money on typically, and that is your roofs, um, your windows, your openings, so the caulkings around your windows and openings, um, your doors, so your weather strips between doors, your, your thresholds at the bottom of the doors, the locks on the doors, these were the main areas at St. Paul's where we took damage. Uh, we had, with, with the entire rebuild and the, and the um, mitigation work that was done, mitigation was done by an out-of-state company, uh, HydroDry, that was to the tune of about $3 million on our facility. And the rebuild will end up somewhere around $2 million. So you're looking at about $5 million of damage from roofs, windows, and doors. Uh, and, and so, you know, passing that information on, having your roofs looked at, having them replaced when they're needed, um, doing campaign drives if needed uh, ahead of time to start allocating the money for it. Um, if you can touch on your building envelope prior to a storm season, that's a strong suggestion. Um, and then the other was to, to pre-position some storm assets. And one of them being a, a contractor, getting into relationship with a contractor um, entering into an agreement uh, with them where they would be uh, a preferred vendor for your, your church. Not necessarily anyone you were tied to by contract, but someone that you would call on for first bid if a roof need replaced, even if it weren't storm related, or uh, even someone you would call on to, to have bid for other work that you do around the facility to create a relationship with someone who, when a storm comes and you call, they know who you are. And they're more willing to serve you and get your get your school and your church back online and get your community serving, get you serving your community again. Um, so on, on the building side, that's that's a lot of what we learned. That, you know that the damage doesn't didn't necessarily come from walls falling down, and it it didn't come from um, even windows being broken. It came from poor envelope uh, maintenance, caulking, thresholds, roofs. Uh, and that's good. That was similar to what I saw at St. Matthew's when we went there to, to do the repair. Um, and it's not a lot from a lack of stewardship. It's just from a lack of awareness that, hey, under the right conditions, these things, if they're not properly maintained, will fail and the damage is not minimal. Um, so those are some things to touch on there. One of the other things, uh, you know, the next step I wanted to go into is what we learned to uh, what we learned about from, from insurance and how insurance interacts, works, pays, communicates with your contractor that you may choose. Um, and this was, this was, this held true through St. Paul's as well as St. Matthew's in that in the facilities, as especially as someone who, who is a church member at St. Paul's and a school member as well, we have our own names for the different, the six or eight different buildings around the facility that we all know them as within the church. Well, the insurance provider does not use those same affectionate names that we do. They use building one, building two, building three, or what have you. 
That becomes a problem on the back end of a claim when you're trying to consolidate or apply cost to compare for the insurance company. So we might call it uh, Hemingway Hall is our gym building, but the insurance company may call it building 3A. And so when we send them our cost analysis, our invoices all attributed to some building name, it, it doesn't correlate with what they have. And, and then you end up with some of the subcontractor invoices calling it building one or building one C and it's really building 3A on the insurance claim so the whole point in sharing all this with is to get a contractor that you trust ahead of time and relay to them exactly how your policy reads for each building and then require them to have their subcontractors and their billing reflect those policy building tags. Um, and so, you know, that's that's slowed down some final payments on St. Paul's that we're dealing with, and it's slowed down some final payments on on St. Matthew's. I mean, we've overcome it, but it's time delayed. It didn't have to be there had it been looked at ahead of time. Um, the other was was to, and it's one of the things I've focused on in business as well, as far as insurance, we typically, or we sometimes end up having to, from a budget standpoint, choose the, the least desirable insurance with the highest deductible or the least amount of coverage, just so we can afford to have some insurance in place. Um, I can tell you that that was detrimental after Ida to two churches I looked at that we didn't end up doing work with because they did not have the money to cover the deductible. Um, they were more focused on front end price that the church would have to pay out or school would have to pay out uh, when they purchased the policy and didn't take into account that, hey, if one of these large storms come, we are going to have damage on every building and do we have the deductible to make up the difference? So. Um, it was awful to see that, but it's something that needs to be looked at by the vestry and leadership of each church, in my opinion, to assess whether or not you're getting coverage just to have coverage or you're getting coverage that's actually going to serve you when it's needed. Um, so that was a bit of advice there. And then each insurance company, whether it's church insurance or, or some other insurance company that, that you guys have for your individual facilities has a list of preferred vendors. So my suggestion would be to get like this time of year, each year, get in touch with your insurance company, ask them for their list of preferred vendors for mitigation company. That's who gets rid of all the wet stuff that's in the building and a list of if they have local rebuild contractors or put back contractors already on their list. Um, and, and so what that'll do is give you a list of names that you can reach out prior to before a storm to establish a relationship with. Um, because, you know, even if you have the money, if you don't have a relationship with the right contractor or a mitigation contractor, you're going to be on a waiting list. Your, your church is left dangling. Your school community is left with no school for the kids. Um, so if you can get on top of that on the front end, um, we, we found that to be definitely time prudent. Um, with that, I'll take questions if you guys have any. Are you on the preferred vendor list? I'm on the preferred vendor list now for church insurance, yes, after St. Matthew's and St. Paul's. Uh, but um, they have several other contractors that are as well. So more importantly, it's about, you know, building the relationship with someone. Get, get somebody to your church who is a building professional who can assess the building for you, you know. Um, and even if it's an assessment that you don't want to hear, that you know you have some roof that needs to be replaced or some caulking that needs to be done that's going to be semi-expensive. If you get them out there to assess it, write it up, then they know about those things prior to a storm. So when you call them, they're more familiar with you and your facility. Do you see a value in uh, having um, a list of resources of, of people that, that other that churches say, I recommend this group. Um, you might want to call them as, as a preparation. Because it, it, you know, sometimes it's um, knowing even who, who, who do I make a call to as I'm pulling together this list. Do you, do you all think, this may be for the whole group. Do you see a, a value in having a, um, a list of, of recommended um, vendors that you've used? Um, um, yeah, from from a um, from an insurance perspective, 
it's really good to get the provide uh, the insurance preferred vendor list and start there for your area because um, that that is someone that the insurance company is comfortable with how they've built in the past and how they've performed uh, on the project and completed the project. So, for instance, um, you know. Uh, there are contractors that will drive a claim up and it'll they'll eventually get paid, but they're going to slow the church rebuild down tremendously while they try to drive the claim up. Um, so I can answer a little bit to that with Hydro Dry, um, church insurance recommended them immediately and there was no hesitation to them getting that contractor out because they called and working immediately. Yeah, yeah, and you know, you're right, Linda. Yeah, and that was critical having the uh, having the phone number and the clergy or the leadership's hand to of the claims number prior to that storm. I mean, to be the first person to call is is huge. Call your insurance company and report the claim. You know, and that gets back down to having an organized team knowing who's. As we talked about in the breakout room, there's going to be a group or several people that stay regardless of the storm. Knowing who those people are and and being able to um, give them a, a conduit to get information out on the condition of the church, even if it's, you know, like I did, I stayed uh, from the day after the storm on, but I would have to drive out to Picayune where I was sleeping at night to be able to get word out to Father Rob of pictures, how the building was. And I didn't do that, every, but every other day, but at least every other day, he was getting updated information on the facility. Yeah, and Stephen, kind of beyond, once that church insurance vendor list um, kind of gets circulated, and that'll be a kind of follow up task um, for some of us, I think it would be helpful, at least on a deanery um, basis, yeah. to know. Like, I was just thinking a, a milk delivery truck shows up at St. Michael's Preschool at least once a week and drops off crates of milk. And I'm, I'm wondering if Christ Episcopal School also has kind of similar relationship and just who do, who are the vendors that the Episcopal churches use? Um, right. That's a great point. Yeah. And, and your maintenance, I just the last thing I you know, want to stress is, is your, your roof maintenance and your roof assessment is critical for every facility that I saw after Ida. Ida was the largest wind event that I've I mean, it was larger than Katrina as far as wind event and the impact and the widespread damage of that wind event. And so what it did was expose, you know, roofs aren't sexy to pay for. They're just not flashy and shiny and they're just not, but they're so, nece they're so necessitous to be able to survive this type of storm. At caulking around windows, weather stripping on doors. I mean, those things are so simple, but if you, if you don't have one some assigned to check it, who knows what they're looking at, it's going to be an issue for you like it was for us. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'll make sure to include um, Chad and Tim's information to all those. Um, Tim, Chad, if you can just put your info in the um, chat box, I'll make sure after the fact that it gets distributed. Uh, well, I want to turn it over to Tim Gagliano. Tim is our the kind of go-to IT person for many Episcopal churches in our diocese, and so he's the first person I thought of, and um, it's going to talk about IT preparedness. Appreciate the time. I've been in IT for years. I've been independent for 17 of those years now, and uh, it's been a pleasure to work uh, with different organizations from nonprofits to churches to, to private. You get a different aspect when you work with a lot of different people. Uh, one thing that I think, I mean, we're all coming out of the COVID experience. We're all coming out of Hurricane Ida. And I looked at this in a different way. You know, it was always IT prepared. By IT preparedness from the standpoint of how do we recover after the storm. But I think it's not just recovering, it's also functioning. And that's what I really look at in, in, this, in this presentation is to consider not only how do we recover, you know, but how to function. So what I'd like to do is focus on recovering first. There, there's certain information that you need when you're going to recover your network. It's far 
starts from getting documentation. Just like with insurance, you want to have an inventory of all your equipment that includes your routers, your switches, your computers, uh, you know, how many monitors, those things. Picture inventory is very helpful. Insurance companies love that. And, you know, these are physical assets that on your campus and you want to have a good inventory. Um, having a network schematic, how is the network actually set up? If you have an on-premise server, what's the IP address? If you, you know, what is the IP address of the routers, the printers, the copiers, the access points? It's amazing how much equipment is actually on, uh, on a campus, a church campus. You want to have a record of the username and passwords for all these devices. I always get into the point where I go into, is what's the password? I don't know. It, those things, you know, recovering a network when you have all the equipment, having all the passwords and usernames is makes it life so much easier. You don't have to reset your equipment to factory default and start all over again. License information for software. That's a big one. And a lot of people don't even think about that. So whether it is your license key for Microsoft Office or QuickBooks or whatever software you, you use, that's a big one. And don't forget about the hardware that we now, almost all of us are video streaming. So that's another piece of hardware that you want to get information on. And often there's licensing for that as well. Get your internet provider information. What's their phone number for the support number? What is your account? Who, what is the username and password for the account? The PIN number, the security questions and answers. Uh, you want to have more than one person who can authorize changes on the internet account. Because if that person's evacuated or you can't get them, they won't talk to you if you're not on the list of approved people. So those documentation things are very important. Now, in regard to protecting your hardware, I'm going to tell you, it is much easier to return equipment than to replace it. It just is, okay? But it's not always practical to remove all your equipment. It's just not. But if you can identify, you know what, I'm going to replace a computer this year. Instead of replacing it with a desktop, I'm going to replace it with a laptop because the laptop can be taken off-site either. Or use a mini PC as opposed to a full desktop because it's easier to evacuate. Um, when you can't evacuate it, disconnect your equipment from electricity. Disconnect it from any network cable. Electricity surges love copper wiring. And it will go through and will burn your computers, burn your routers, burn your switches. So disconnect that if you can. If you're able cover the equipment, wrap it in plastic bags. I know it sounds funny, but I was working for a company around, this was not Katrina, this it came through Lafayette. I was working for a company out there and we were trying to figure out what do we do with this home health office? And there was no way to remove everything. So we came up with the, let's just wrap all the computers in contractor bags and zip tie them. The roof of that building blew off. We were able to relocate them to a temporary facility. We unpacked the plastic bags and the computers booted up. So it saved a lot of time, saved a lot of money, and it wasn't a whole lot of uh, expense. It did take some work, but a little work in the beginning can save a lot of time and effort uh, in recovery. If you have a, uh, here's another idea, move equipment to upper floors. If you have uh, a second floor or attics, choir lofts, uh, and again, wrap it, wrap it up if you can. Uh, if, you, if you're in a flood prone area, get it as high as you can if you can't evacuate that equipment. And as we know, after uh, COVID, uh, equipment can be sometimes hard to get. So you wanna try and protect it the best you can. Now, the most important aspect of recovering from a disaster is having your data protected. A computer has no value other than the data that it stores. So you want to make sure that you have current backups. You want to have a local backup, if possible, to a hard drive. And you want to have an off-site cloud backup. You know, we talked about losing the internet. Well, if, if your backup is only off-site and you're relying on the internet to recover it, 
you may be out for weeks, a month before you can even get that data back down. So if you have it on an external hard drive, then you can recover that data a lot faster. Um, but let's see here. Remember this when it comes to recovery. The priority in terms of utilities after a storm is clear access. So that's removing materials that block the roads, then restore power, and then everything else. So before the internet can get restored, before phones can get restored, service power has to be restored. So, you know, you want to kind of think of what we can do to recover. I can't do anything until power comes back. So that's why I say a local backup is really important. Now, functioning during a disaster. We've all had to function during COVID. We've all had to make adjustments. We had to work remotely. We had to change the way we work, not only business, but also in nonprofits, churches, schools, et cetera. Uh, as we know, these events can last for weeks, months, and it's, it's frankly no fun. So we get to be out of power for days. We heard about uh, church, uh, St. Michael's possibly getting solar power. Uh, that's, that's probably an exception for, for most. Um, internet and phones, again, will only be restored after power is restored. Materials to replace equipment could be in short supply. And funds to replace equipment. You might want to consider, should we start allocating some resources, uh, some funds in a budget for replacing items? Because if you're waiting on insurance money, who knows how long that could be? if you need to replace equipment. Now, obviously in order to function, you need power. So we discussed generator power. Uh, then you have fuel concerns if you're using gas or diesel. We, solar generators is an option. You need to determine how much power do you really need? Maybe you only want to operate temporarily for like an hour or two, just to get information to disseminate back and forth to parishioners. It doesn't have to be 24 seven power. So think about that. And we discussed about strategic relationships with a parish uh, outside of the area that you could utilize as a resource, evacuate to their facility, utilize their power and internet so you can get back up and running. And again, access to data, again, whether it's local backup or cloud hosted, which of course requires the internet, but you do have options. You have hotspots on your phones you can tether. You can actually use, um, they have prepaid, like uh, um, T-Mobile has a prepaid um, hotspot. And before hurricane season, you may wanna go ahead and activate your prepaid card and after hurricane season, let it go in limbo. It's a pretty inexpensive way to uh, have mobile internet. Let's see. Uh, going back to the, let's see here. Also in regard to cellular backup, many internet providers are starting to make that part of their plan. So for instance, I've seen Spectrum and Cox Cable actually install a cellular backup to their internet. Um, again, you do need electricity, but that is a way that you can restore uh, internet to your facility if they have that process, if they have that uh, feature. So you want to contact your internet provider and see if they have a cellular backup option. Now, the biggest thing in functioning through a disaster is communication. Now, I know that Father Robert's going to talk about that. I wanted to bring a couple of things. If you're using an old standard phone system, you may want to consider the option of changing to what they call hosted voice over IP, which is a hosted cloud phone system. During a storm, your phones will continue to ring. They might not ring at the facility. I mean, your internet can go down, your power can go down, but your phones will still ring to this hosted solution. You can create an auto attendant where you can put in information about what the current status of the parish is, uh, how to con uh, uh, contact uh, certain people, investry members, uh, however you wanna set up the auto attendant. 
it, it's, it's really limitless on how you want to use this. And many of the hosted voice over IP solutions also can ring to your cell phone. So wherever you go, again, thinking of those people who may have evacuated and have access, you might want to make them part of this solution. Uh, it was discussed earlier about a website, and I have here, turn that website from a brochure into a communication tool. You can update information about the status of the facility, where to get uh, food, where to get uh, gasoline, other things. So make that website part of your communication protocol. We talked about the call tree. Uh, you also have social media. Uh, we've gone to Facebook Live services and in morning prayer. You can continue to do those things during a, during a natural disaster, not just COVID. So those things are, uh, I guess, you know, part of our plan now. Uh, they're on Zoom. Here's another option for people if they've evacuated. Well, we can still meet as a vestry uh, or as uh, any of our other groups. Uh, we have Microsoft Teams and Google Meetings. They have options to communicate. Email. I don't think anyone hosts their own email anymore. They used to have their own servers that host email. I think pretty much everyone's away, uh, gone from that. Um, if your parish is not using Microsoft 365 nonprofit, then you all need to consider that. Uh, Microsoft has allowed uh, through their nonprofit portal the ability to host email for nonprofit organizations for free. And you can get 10 premium Office 365 licenses and 25 standard licenses. That should be able to cover everybody in your staff uh, with free email, free access to cloud storage on Microsoft, um, OneDrive and SharePoint, the use of Microsoft Teams. It's, they've been very generous about that. And if you're currently not using that or paying for your, your email services, that's, that's something you should consider. And then of course, we talked about text messaging, apps like GroupMe and whatnot. I know uh, Robert's gonna talk about that in more detail. Any questions? It was a lot to cover. It's a, it's, it's a lot in a network. <laughs> Just right quick, um, you were saying that because the 365 nonprofit covers 25 standard licenses and 10 premium. Yes, you, you have the ability to assign 10 uh, business premium licenses and 25 standard licenses. So really 35 people can get free hosted email and 10 of those people can download Microsoft Office including Word, Excel, Outlook, PowerPoint, uh, at no charge. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Tim, uh, just um, to see if this is still a thing, uh, which computers you think are critical to have uninterrupted power supplies? And um, what are the like priority computers? Um, and do you still recommend them? Um, well, when you say recommend, you mean backup, you mean UPS devices? Yes, UPS devices. Yes, no, I, UPS devices are great. They're generally, you're not going to get a lot of, pot of time from them. Mm -hmm. The design of a, of a UPS is essentially to allow your computer not to be shut off just instantly. So it allows, it's really designed to get that, get you to a place where you can boot that computer down. There's also software if you connect the UPS with the USB or communication cable that will actually shut down your computer if you're not there. Mm -hmm. so it's really designed not necessarily to keep you going for any for right. long time, but really designed to give you better search protection and allow you to shut your computer down safely. For a disaster, if you know a storm's coming in, I recommend that you disconnect it from all power. Okay. Unplug it from the wall because a surge, if, if, the build, if your building gets struck by lightning, unless you have a whole building surge protection system, you're rolling the dice on what, you know, the effects of that surge through the system. Anybody else? Any other questions on the kind of the IT realm? Oh, and I will add this going in regard to contractor, you know, have a relationship with a local IT vendor that you trust. 
And, you know, because often they can do the assessment, they can do the inventory and things like that. Yeah, more than your local geek squad. Um, yeah. So on that note, Tim, if you could put your contact info in the chat box, I'm going to talk about communication in times of disasters. Um, one thing that kind of I've, I've um, St. Michael's is the second uh, congregation that I've been a part of kind of on the payroll side. Um, I've been a part of probably six or seven other congregations prior to that on the lay side. And knowing your flock is something that I think a lot of folks take for granted. Um, summertime is usually a little bit slower in terms of um, content or kind of the, the, the ministry year. And so I hope um, take advantage of those slower office days to clean up who your members are, especially as we come out of the pandemic. There are some folks that we haven't seen in two years, and now is a great time to check in with them. Um, but if you have a database, that's fantastic. Even better is if you use it. And so whatever type of database you have, I know at St. Michael's, we use an ACS product called Realm. I highly recommend it. It is, um, the price point is based off of your average attendance, not your membership. And so um, we average in about 70 um, on a Sunday and we pay maybe $75 a month for an incredible product that we're just skimming its possibilities. Um, but one thing that it allows is to print out um, anytime we want a PDF of our like church directory. And so that's something that we're starting to incorporate into our kind of every six months, print out a physical copy of our church membership list. Um, it's also cloud-based. So if in times of evacuation, we can still access that information. So number one, know who your people are. And on a every six, eight, 12 months, make sure someone checks in with them. Um, so clean up your membership roles and have print out hard copies, especially in times of evacuations. Once you know who your people are, figure out the best ways to communicate with them, whether that's email, phone calls, text messages. Um, some folks, you can rely on them checking your Facebook group or Facebook page. Some folks will need a phone call um, in certain times of disaster. They may need a knock on their door. And so have those, um, have a plan before you need a plan. And I wanna, their group me was mentioned earlier, that's an app. Um, one thing that St. Michael's uses is a website called simpletexting.com. They specifically have um, folks in their business that work with churches and nonprofits but simpletexting.com is a website-based software and there's an app for it where we can put in all of the cell phone numbers of our parishioners and from a computer or from the app, I can blast out a text to all of them. And the great thing about texting is that message will float in the network until their phones are able to receive it. Um, similarly to voice over IP, we can schedule messages to go out, um, say Saturday afternoon, when you know that a storm is coming and you've already canceled church. Saturday afternoon, you can set a reminder, a text to go out to all the, all the parishioners. Mm -hmm. We are not having church in person. It'll be over Zoom, it'll be over Facebook page. Um, you, can send, you can create groups. So if you only wanna send a message to 10 people at a time, and they reply to you, you can access it um, anywhere you have internet access. And so that's a situation where if you build a relationship with a, with a congregation somewhere else in the country, they could, be, they could have access to that communication um, device. When you have phone trees, when you have opportunities where people say a phone call goes to one person that person calls five, those five call another five. 
it's easy to get information down the chain, but make sure you have ways to get the information back up the chain. And so if I call my eight vestry members and each of them calls five people who calls five more people, somewhere in that script, you need to be able to say, oh, you have a tree in your roof or there's a tree in your driveway. There needs to be a way for that information to get back up the chain to the vestry members or to the priest or to the junior warden. Um, not just, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Well, I hope something happens. Um, Cause that's, it, that, that's a one way conversation. And that's the last thing we need um, in times of disasters. So those are kind of the, the, the pinpoints. If you do depend on emailing to communicate with your congregation, um, don't simply put 200 email addresses in your Gmail or Yahoo or MSN um, Hotmail um, message box and blast it out because over time, the email wizards are going to look at, look at your activity and say it's spam. And pretty soon, those messages will not be received. And so um, MailChimp is an email software that if you have less than, I think, 300 or 400 contacts, it's free. Um, and so there are free email software um, communication avenues. Um, you can also see who opens your email. You can see that. Um, even though you sent, um, say Michael sends out a weekly email to about 200 people, and I know that only about 105 open it. And so I can look and see, okay, these 105 people got the information. What about the other 95? Um, don't, just because you sent an email, never assume that it was read. Um, quick lesson that I learned from the Diocese of Texas a few days after disaster, they trained, um, Texas is about four times larger than us in terms of number, number of congregations and number of clergy, but they trained years ago, they trained all their deacons um, in, they would call it the cooler ministry, where during hurricane season, every deacon in the diocese has a cool, a water cooler, one that has wheels with a case of water inside. And anytime a storm was on the horizon, one of the responsibilities of those deacons was to put ice in that cooler and keep it on hand. And um, if, a, if and when uh, the hurricane hit, those deacons in the area would go to the local congregation, make sure everything was okay. And then they would walk around the neighborhood with those coolers of ice cold water and have conversations with people. Um, I know there's a church in Tallahassee that would do every Wednesday, they would have, they would have, uh, Eucharist lunch. And then they had about 10 coolers of ice cold water that they would just walk around their neighborhood and have conversations with their neighbor neighbors, building those relationships before the storm hit. Um, so especially in the New Orleans area in the Baton Rouge area where we have congregations um, I know St. John's Thibodeau is, has a lot of neighbors around it. Um, simple things as walking around the neighborhood and giving out ice cold water or Gatorade um, and being there, being the faithful presence of the body of Christ in times of disasters is the transformational work that we're called to do. Um, those are my points on communication. Um, any questions before we kind of do general Q and A? Awesome. Robert, I will say this. Um, it brings me back to after Katrina. I was on vestry at St. Augustine's after Katrina, and the discussion was, would we have our pumpkin patch? And some were against it. Most of us were for it. And 
the response from the community was overwhelming. People stopped by. Thank you for being here. You're bringing some sense of normalcy. So, you know, when we get challenged uh, as a community, as a, a community of faith, dig deep and do the things that you might not think you can do because it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Well, if there are no more questions, I'm gonna end us in prayer and then stop the recording. Um, Ken and Reed, if you would just hang out for a second and we'll chat for a second. Ms. Terry. Before, before we close, um, just from my perspective, um, listening to Tim and, of course, knowing how your brain works, I think it's great that we have all the backups and everything with our ITs and our computers. But knowing, again, talking about going through Katrina and, and uh, even before that, I personally still like to have a three ring binder of hard copies of everything. You, you need to know your banking numbers, um, your, your, your insurance, not only your numbers, but how to get in touch with them, who to know. And I have a three ring binder with every bit of that in there, all the things that Tim talked about. And I made one for Father Robert and I know he looked at me like, oh my God, she's so old school. But sometimes it's like I used to tell my fifth graders, it's great that you can use a calculator, but if the battery craps out in the middle of the test, you better know how to add two plus two. And so I like the old school three ring binder. And I just think that's an easy thing to do for people who might not be quite as tech savvy. I agree. That's excellent. And, and, and certainly have, um, um, I encourage, have fun with those free green blinders. Um, every couple of pages, add in like a picture of a Disney character. Um, and the three green binders, folders, information are great if they're used. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm doing a wedding at a church on St. Charles, not our cathedral in a few weeks. If you know which one I'm talking about, I'll let you figure that out. And um, I was there early and um, I was in the office of the parish admin and sitting on the bookshelf, um, I realize this is recording and I apologize to that church, but on the bookshelf is the diocesan disaster toolkit, like folder that I think Deacon Elaine Clements put together about 20 years ago. I'm like, oh, neat. I'm like, I have one in my closet. It keep, I update it every year. I wonder the last time it was updated and I open it and it, there are documents that the most recent piece of paper I found was 2009. And so those, those tools are great mm -hmm. if they're not rusty, yes. if they get used. So yeah. um, have a plan, know your plan before you need the plan. Mm -hmm. All that said, let us pray. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night. And give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted. Shield the joyous and all for your love's sake. Amen. Amen. Yeah.